Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, everyone. I am your host, Zach Beach, and I'm here with the incredible mindfulness expert and author, Julie Potiker. Hi, Julie, and welcome to the show. So happy to be here. Thanks. Today, we are going to talk about being your own best friend forever, or BFF for short. But before we get into that, let's learn a little bit more about Julie. For those that don't know, mindfulness expert and author Julie Potiker is an attorney who began her serious study and investigation of mindfulness after graduating from the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program at the University of California, San Diego. She went on to become trained to teach mindful self-compassion and complete the Positive Neuroplasticity Training Professionals course with Rick Hansen. Now, she shares these and other mindfulness techniques with the world through her Mindful Methods for Life trainings and her new book, Life Falls Apart, But You Don't Have To, Mindful Methods for Staying Calm in the Midst of Chaos. Hello, Julie. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm just fine. I'm grateful to be here. I really appreciate you coming on to the show, and there's so much I want to ask you and talk to you about. And our topic for today is being your own best friend. But before we get into that, I'd love to just talk a little bit about mindfulness and happiness, because we all want to be happy, and I imagine a best friend would want us to be happy too. So tell our listeners that may not know, how is mindfulness a path to more happiness? Wow, that's a super loaded question, Zach. (laughs) I teach half-day workshops answering that question. So really the practice is about seeing what's real and cultivating a practice that can hold all of it, right? With your mind clear and your heart open. Mm -hmm. And it's being with and working with what is, what life is, what's going on moment to moment and uh, learning to approach yourself with care and concern and love in the way in which you would treat a dear friend, learning to Mm. treat your own self that way, Mm -hmm. mindful self-compassion, you know, mindfulness, seeing what's going on. When you notice yourself suffering, treating yourself as you would treat a dear friend, and then common humanity, which is the third pillar of mindful self-compassion, which is understanding that there's how many billions of us on the planet? In between seven and eight billion. So when Mm -hmm. we're feeling scared or angry or sad or whatever emotion that might not feel good, there's Mm -hmm. billions of people sharing that emotion. And when we're feeling joy and happiness and love, there's billions of people sharing that emotion. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's almost like seeing what's going on inside your own body and outside your own body and then connecting yourself to the planet. Mm. So you're saying mindfulness both increases your capacity to be with what is, including the joy and the sorrows. And in that connection, you get connected to all things and feel happier as a result? Correct. I read your book, and it was so fantastic, these mindful methods for life. And it was really surprising to hear your backstory. Um, And you actually originally learned about mindfulness from a doctor who recommended it to you after you were showing... uh, I was a train wreck. (laughs) (laughs) I was an absolute train wreck. And I thought I had a brain tumor because I had the wrong words coming out of my mouth. Wow. And, you know, he did the whole psych social interview after the brain scans came back normal and said, you have too much stress. Hmm. And I was like, wow, I had three teenagers. They all had ADHD. They all still do. But now they're thankfully in their 20s and don't have to be in school anymore. It's really difficult when you have some of these learning differences and you're in school Mm -hmm. and my parents were aging and one of them wasn't well. And, you know, it was just 
everything I was doing in my life, it was just too much and I wasn't handling it well. And so that neurologist recommended mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a 40-year-old curriculum. I just was unaware of it. Mm -hmm. And so that, I took that class and I was like, wow, there's a lot of neuroscience here. And being a lawyer, I'm a little bit on the nerdy side. And so I started taking the neuroscience classes and I just really went deep and was fascinated that we have so much more control over our happiness and our mood than we realize. We Mm. actually, what we think changes our brain and that changes everything else. That's amazing. It is amazing. And it's amazing to hear you say that your life was a train wreck. Because I wouldn't be surprised if some people are listening and they feel like their life now is currently a train wreck. And I'm wondering what the beginning of the unraveling was. So, you know, you learn these mindfulness techniques. And then how did that sort of change the way that you lived your life that it became easier and less stressful for you to live? Well, so this is this is a long time coming. We're talking over 10 years of daily practice. So it's not like a quick fix. I don't want to lead anybody to believe that it's a quick fix. Mm -hmm. But I started going on retreats and really learning about my internal landscape. And then all of the really incredible, and many of them were online, um, courses that I took taught me a different way to understand my brain and my mind both and I learned how to be with what is and work with what is to make myself happier and it's not like loosey-goosey looking at the world through rose-colored glasses because you really do see all the crap but then Mm -hmm. you have a choice when you feel overwhelmed I mean you're you're still gonna have your heart broken when you see I'm just thinking of, I I can't get George Floyd out of my mind because that's what's going on in our world in America right now. Mm -hmm. So I watched the video and was heartbroken along with the rest of the world. And you hold that heartbreak. Mm. It doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. But you figure out how to work with it in your body so that you can hold that heartbreak and you cannot let it swamp you so that so that you tell yourself what you need to hear and then you you can make the next wise action Mm. it prompted me to join an organization called surge showing up for racial justice so they do advocacy and education for the white population in order to be effective partners with black lives matter so you know I don't think I could have done that without my practice. I might have just stayed in bed crying for Mm -hmm. however long with the covers pulled over my head. And instead, because I can hold the heartbreak and my mind is clear, I can see how I possibly could be part of the solution. And I wouldn't have been able to do that before. I just would have been rolled up in a ball. Mm. So before you almost kind of felt trapped by your stress and emotions and you find mindfulness allowed you a sort of greater sense of freedom to respond to your situations. Yeah. I mean, I also, I also rewired my brain. Mm. Um, so I, on purpose, when I have anything positive, I let it land, I enrich it and absorb it to create a happy bridge in my brain. And I've been doing that. I don't know how many times a day, 12, 15, 25, um, so that I'm counteracting the negativity bias that we have because we're primates. So every time you have something like, that's a beautiful sunset, what's for dinner? No, that's a beautiful sunset. Like, wow, look at those colors. Mm. Oh my Mm. gosh, that's amazing. That's enough. I felt that in my body, even just saying that to you. I called to mind a beautiful sunset. That's enough to, to what fires together, wires together, experience dependent neuroplasticity. Thank you, Rick Hansen. That's enough to create a happy bridge. So you're constantly creating these positive, happy bridges in your brain, and mm. you're pruning out the bad ones. It's like thinking of your, your brain being a garden. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really love 
the metaphor of your brain as a garden and intentionally shining light and attention on the things that you want to grow and pulling out the weeds of the thought patterns that you don't want to grow. Exactly, because it's a positive feedback loop, mm. you know, mm -hmm. like what you think, what you put your attention on with your with your intention and your attitude, it creates a, a positive feedback loop or a negative one, right? Mm. Well, you don't want the negative one. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. And let's link this thought together a little bit with compassion because you recently did mention the challenges that the world is facing, first coronavirus and now the tensions around the terrible and, and heart-wrenching, I'll say, murder of George Floyd in front yep. of people. Um, because you do write about having compassion for ourselves as well as the world and letting our hearts just radiate love outward. Let's talk about the first step, sort of having compassion for ourselves, because it is heart-wrenching to see what's happening in the world. And there is that temptation, as you said, to almost curl yourself uh, into a ball. Mm -hmm. But you call this your bust your bra state of being. <laughs> um, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I find when I'm leading loving kindness meditation or I'm being led in loving kindness meditation, when you call to mind the being that brings you joy and you can't help but be filled with expansive, warm, good feelings and a smile naturally arises because this being brings you joy. I, I often use, we have four dogs, I often use this one specific dog, Madeline. She's a Briard. She's tawny and she has these big brown eyes. And when I call her to mind, I literally feel my body, which is the mindfulness piece, the interoception piece, the inside of my body. I feel filled with joy and I smile. And then mm. I'll add myself, so it's the two of us, so that's just like bursting. And then I'll add friends and family, and then I'll add the whole globe, which we really mm. need now. We need all sentient beings to be painted with this glorious brush of good wishes. May we be safe, may we be happy, may we be healthy, may we live with ease, or whatever phrases work for each specific person. I happen to love those phrases, the classic ones. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel, I literally feel my heart and my chest kind of radiating out this like gushing glorious love. And because I'm a, a woman who wears a bra, I think about it as a Buster bra moment because mm. it's like so much pouring out of your chest so much so that you could break your bra. Hmm. That's a beautiful process that you just described. Is first you think of somebody that, or something, you know, even a pet that's very easy for you to love, almost as a way of like greasing the wheels, so to speak. Exactly. You're warming your heart up. And then extending that to yourself. Yeah, you know why we do that. In the mindful self-compassion curriculum that I'm trained to teach, the reason that we choose a being that brings you joy and we don't start just with ourselves, may I, is because it avoids that whole inner critic, am I worthy, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. So you're already warmed up, you've already warmed up your heart by choosing a being, and then you just sort of sneak yourself in. <laughs> it's a trick, it's a good trick. Right, and you mentioned the inner critic, so let's talk a little bit more about that, because I think many of us are familiar with that harsh inner critic, um, that almost like nagging internal voice. You know, you might wake up in the morning and, and you know, say that I'm going to love myself today. And then you go to the bathroom and you see a big zit on your forehead. And then suddenly the love that you had just vaporizes and you immediately turn to that judge and critic. Now, you actually recommend in your book to thank your inner bitch. Yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about that. How do we shift from being our own critic and what exactly do you mean when you say to thank your inner bitch? Well, so your inner critic is, historically speaking, in psych parlance, the voice of an early caregiver. So it's not always, it's not always the mother, but it's often the mother. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of a deep dive that we do in the mindful self-compassion curriculum, but it's based on... Dr. Schwartz's internal family systems. And he has a whole institute where he trains clinicians 
um, to do this work. And his work is more complicated. There's more parts. The MSC curriculum is sort of like internal family systems light. And how it works is you think about an issue that's not ten, not a 10 out of 10 on the oi, oi ve scale, just like a I wish I exercised more kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you write a letter to yourself mm. from your inner critical voice. And mine, which I actually published in the book, was like, get up off the couch, you lazy fat ass, you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> and you write it, you write it, you pay attention to not just the content, but also the tone of voice, because your inner critical voice is usually really a bitch, right? Mm -hmm. And then you write a letter on the very same issue from your self-compassionate voice. And if you don't know that you have one, you actually do have one. And so how you do that is you imagine a dear friend having the same issue and you write the letter to your dear friend. Mm -hmm. Sweetheart, I just want you to exercise more because I love you and I know that it's healthier for you and I want you to live a long life because you have so much value, whatever, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you realize that you have that voice inside you. You could talk to yourself that way. Mm. And then you do another one with a really big issue. And in the exercise, you come to realize that your inner critic was doing a job for you, but not skillfully. That now that you're an adult, your inner critic was probably trying to keep you safe or have you do your best, you know, raise the bar, that kind of thing. That's a really beautiful phrase that our inner critic is doing a job, but not skillfully. Uh -huh. And even the use of exercise, I think, is a good example is that, yes, that inner critic who's giving you judgment and blame and shame around not exercising does have at some point your best interest in mind, like doing something that's good for yourself, but just not doing it in the right way. And that begins our shift, you know, from being our own worst critic to being our own best friend. And I'm wondering what you recommend for our listeners of what people can do to care for themselves and be their own best friend uh, in their life. I mean, when something happens that's that feels really bad, I'll either do a self-compassion break from the mindful self-compassion curriculum or I'll, or I'll run through RAIN, R-A-I-N. I teach RAIN all the time, but I'll say, I'll put my hand on my heart because that's my soothing touch place to downregulate any cortisol or adrenaline that I might be feeling from feeling a negative emotion. So my hand's on my heart. That already helps soothe me because it's mm -hmm. releasing oxytocin and endorphins. And then I'll say to myself, Julie, sweetheart, that was so sad or that was so hard. Oh, it's really hard to feel this way. You know, I've got mm. your back. I really love you. What do you need to hear right now, honey? And then I'll tell myself what I need to hear right now. And then I'll say, well, well, well what do you need to do right now? What might help mm. you right now? And I'll look at my joy list, which I have written down because it's a trick of the trade mm. that you ought to have written down. And I'll see on that list it says, call Steffi or call Stacy mm. mm -hmm. or take a bath, take a walk, you know, something, something soothing, something that would make me feel good. So tell us more about this joy list. I'm so curious. I have my students just free associate what would bring them joy. Mm. And just sit with a pen and paper for maybe five minutes and write down all the little things that they can think of and all the big things that they can think of. Mm -hmm. And if spending time with your grandkids is one of them, it needs to be like FaceTiming with your grandkids if they're out of town, you know, just a couple parameters around what's on your joy list because they have to be things that you can actually do. Mm -hmm. And then when you're feeling rotten, you've got this list to look at. And then mm. you intentionally choose something to do that might make you feel better. And then at night, before you go to bed, when you're writing in your gratitude journal, which you must do because the benefits of having a gratitude practice are ironclad. Mm -hmm. And when you're writing down 
what did I enjoy today? What am I grateful for today? You chose something from your joy list, and if it really felt good, you created a happy bridge in your brain, and then you can have gratitude for that. So it mm. kind of all ties up in a, a good little package mm -hmm. of how am I caring for myself. These are intentional practices to care for your mental health and well-being. I love that. We have a gratitude journal, we have a joy list, and we have all these resources to bring more happiness into our life. Right. So there are resources that, that are free, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And we just have to remember to do them. Mm -hmm. How do you remember to remember, Zach, in your own practice? How do you remember? I put little stickers around to remind myself, but what do you do? I'm very much the same way is I'm a big fan of, of lists and even to do lists. You know, I tell, uh, you know, my partner and friend, if I if I don't write it down, I kind of forget to do it. So I do find it incredibly useful to have, you know, almost a self love cheat sheet of things that you can do for yourself, you know, when you're stressed or when you're depleted after a long day, or even if you just need a little bit more energy, you know, go for a walk, do you meditate, different things. So absolutely, I'm a big, big fan of the, the lists. You should see my desk. It's so crazy right now. I actually have three by five cards kind of below my computer monitor. And then I have like sticky, like little pieces of tape. Mm -hmm. I have them stuck up around the monitor too. Mm. You know, little quotes and little, um, little phrases like open up a space between the match mm -hmm. and the flame for patience. Mm. I have no more than my place, no less than my space for humility. And then I have some quotes, like I have one from Rumi that I love. You are not a drop in the ocean. You are the ocean in a drop. And it's, it's intentional. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to hold myself with love so that I can be effective in being of service. Yeah, that was coming up for me just listening to you is... A lot of people, when they start giving love to themselves, they might feel like they're being selfish or they don't deserve it, right? Or there's so many people who are suffering in the world, uh, much more than I am. I need to be, you know, helping them right away. But, you know, you're a perfect example and you describe a perfect example that when we meet our own needs, we are better able to meet the needs of others and do the work that we need to in the world. Absolutely. What you mentioned, Zach, is one of the... Um, like objections or obstacles to self-compassion. And there's, there's over 3,000 research studies now just for the mindful self-compassion course, um, which is evidence-based. And it shows that people that practice self-compassion are more resilient because they're not burning out. So mm -hmm. they're more able to be of service because they're understanding how to fill themselves up and how mm. to how to be in balance so that they can be of service it, it helps prevent burnout yeah let's talk right about this self-compassion piece because earlier you mentioned a bit briefly that there are three pillars to mm -hmm. self-compassion can you describe to us the pillars again mindfulness self-kindness and common humanity so the mindfulness is that like sacred pause of noticing like when challenging emotions are coming up for you or even or even happy emotions it's mm -hmm. just it's just noticing like if you have your morning cup of coffee and you have the first couple sips of your coffee or your tea be a, a mindfulness exercise in pleasure that's mindfulness mm -hmm. so it's it's not just for noticing when you feel bad it's for noticing and leaning in and enriching when you feel good Mm -hmm. And then that self-kindness, I'm wondering, again, what are some concrete actions that people can do to start to be more kind to themselves? I think terms of endearment, honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, I think soothing touch, terms of endearment, really acknowledging that it's hard, speaking to yourself sweetly, and then asking yourself what you need to hear, and then telling yourself what you need to hear. That's the self-compassion break from the MSC curriculum right there. Mm, self-compassion break. I love that. And I am on social media a lot. You know, I felt like I really needed to watch the whole video mm -hmm. of George Floyd's murder and 
you know, I've been feeling like I need to watch a lot of the video of the demonstrations. So you're going to have floods of emotion when watching these things if you're a human being. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> because you have thoughts, feelings, and emotions. And so then it's how are you going to hold all of that and work with it so that you can maintain your balance, your equanimity. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I think it's all about. And, and all of it at the end of the day is so that you can be effective in service if that's your core value, which it is mine to alleviate suffering. Mm. It's one of my core values. So I want to be effective. If I'm just a basket case, I'm not going to be good to anybody. Mm -hmm. I want to get into core values in just a little bit, but let's talk about that final third step of self-compassion. So we've talked about mindfulness and being with whatever, experiencing both the good and the bad. And then we talked about self-kindness, so giving ourselves that self-compassion break, that soothing touch, that terms of endearment. And then we talk about common humanity. So what is common humanity? So I think we touched on this earlier, but to elaborate on it, if you imagine how many people are on the planet that you're sharing this existence with at this time, it can help you gain perspective that it's not just all about you. Mm -hmm. And that larger perspective can help in certain instances stave off going down to the sea in ships, depression, right? Because mm -hmm. it's not just all about you. We're, we're all experiencing a global planetary pandemic together. Right. I hope, hope this isn't triggering for anybody. But four years ago, when my mom was passing away, mm -hmm. I was on the right side of her body, like up at her head with my hand on her chest. And then my sisters were on the other side of her bed. And the nurse was at the foot of the bed, and my dad actually couldn't handle it emotionally, so he was in the living room, and my, my husband was with him. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, at the instant, when she took her final breath, I had this sense that I was connected to every woman on the planet mm. who was with their mother, whose mother was taking the final breath. Mm. It was this unbelievable, almost liquid sense of universal consciousness. And I'm not very like new age. I mean, I'm trained as an attorney. So it was surprising to me to have that mm. touch into this like whoosh of a common humanity thing. Mm -hmm. And then I had this crazy flood of gratitude that we were clean and dry and had a roof over our head and were together and mm. actually it made the experience that could have been so really monstrous it made it gorgeous mm. and I couldn't have done that without my practice mm. I wouldn't have even thought to do it and it happened unconsciously and then I noticed it was happening mm -hmm. But it was because of my practice that that happened. Mm. Now, my dad died six months ago, and that was a whole different story. And I was very intentionally using my practice. I was chanting, and I had one hand in his hand and then my other hand on his heart. Mm. Tell us more about what you mean when you say, like, during this really challenging grief process with your father, you're using your practice so when you say like you have these difficult emotions and your practice is mindful self-compassion? Mm -hmm. mm. I was just reflecting the other day, he's been gone six months, how lucky I am that he died before COVID-19 mm. because mm -hmm. people are losing their loved ones now and they're not allowed to be in the room with them. Right. I was like matching his breathing with my breathing and I was able to be chanting you know, we're here, letting go, we're here, letting go. That's just what came out of my mouth. I don't know why. So it became like a rhythmic refrain. And I could see myself doing it. And I could see myself being in relationship with him. It was intense. It was great. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important, that shared common humanity, that recognizing no matter what challenges that you're going through, you're not alone. Right. Yes, at some point, uh, we all 
you know, unless we're first, you know, God forbid, but at some point, many of us will say goodbye to our parents at some point in our lives. And that is part of the fundamental human condition. I know. I feel, I feel like, sorry that I can't shield my kids from that. <laughs> <laughs> But but I can't. They're like you're never you're never dying. We're freezing you. Like, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, since you do bring up up your kids, first of all, I just want to thank you for being vulnerable uh, in your book about the challenges that you had in raising raising your children. You had first had a boy and then two twin girls, uh-huh. which were a bit of a handful. That's an understatement. <laughs> They were pretty easy peasy, but physically demanding Mm. till they were like, I don't know, 12, 13. And then when they were 14, that's when the stuff hit the fan. Mm -hmm. So they're 25 now, those girls. And they, they once said to me about 10 years ago, just think, if we weren't so difficult to raise, you wouldn't have such a great toolbox. So you should thank us. Yeah, and do you do you share that sentiment that the challenges you've encountered uh, have actually made you stronger? Well, I wouldn't have had this whole kind of middle age career without them. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. I'm living a different life because of the suffering that I went through, mm-hmm. and it's a good life. And in your book, you do talk about this idea of unhooking your parenting so that you can be more in touch with your own happiness. Oh, yeah. And what exactly does that mean to unhook your parenting? Well, Zach, have you ever heard the quote, you're only as happy as your least happy child? You ever heard (laughs) that? Mm -hmm. So when I was writing the book, I said, whoever said that is an idiot and a masochist. And my editor said, you can't say that. People say that. You're going to alienate people. And so I had to like completely whitewash it. I don't remember how it came out, but it was like one unhappy cookie. You know what I mean? It was just like <laughs> totally not my voice because my voice is that's that is bullshit. Because if you're only as happy as your least happy child and you have a child that maybe can't be happy because of mental health issues. And my my one child that had significant mental health issues then moved into substance abuse issues Mm-hmm. If your happiness is tied to that person's happiness, you're not going to be happy. You're screwed. Mm. So you have to figure out how to unhook yourself so that you can have a happy life. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there is a, a very similar phrase that like having a child for the first time is seeing your heart like walk outside your body. Mm. And like, yeah, you care about this this beautiful being so much. And it is extremely difficult to simultaneously source within yourself a source of happiness um, that isn't necessarily dependent on theirs. You know, last night um, I taught a class. I was the author for a book group that read my book. It was It's a parenting group. It's a teen coalition thing. And so the parents have a parenting book group and they chose my book. I was incredibly honored. So mm. I taught a workshop for them last night and I didn't have to kind of do the the whole nuts and bolts of it because they had already read the book. Mm -hmm. But after the class, I stayed on with one of the moms and she was sharing with me that she's just so worried and upset and consumed with the thought that this global pandemic is going to damage her kids, Mm. that her kids are going to feel psychologically permanently damaged. And I said, let's talk about your fears about that. Mm -hmm. Because they're not alone. Every other teenager on the planet is going through what your kids are going through right now. Mm. It's like being in boot camp together. Hmm. You know, in 10 years, they're going to talk about, wow, do you remember that year sucked 2020? We didn't get to do this. We didn't get to do that. We didn't get to do the other thing. We were stuck at home with our parents. You know, I think it could build resilience. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this mom was, she was, her guts were in a blender, Mm. worried about the future of her kids' moods and internal landscape because of what's going on now. Like, I feel bad for her Mm. that she has to carry that burden. And guess what? She doesn't have to. Mm. And that almost reminds me of sort of like the difference between empathy and compassion, because you did talk about compassion being a wonderful way to prevent, you know, burnout. And it can happen with parents. It can happen with professionals in the medical field. 
and the empathy is sort of yeah that resonating with somebody else's emotions with which can be draining over time while compassion mm-hmm. is just a much more spacious way of being present compassion is a verb mm. if you want to think about it like that mm-hmm. so so compassion it's got the empathy piece where you're resonating and you're feeling the feelings but the piece that's really key is the desire to alleviate the suffering so with compassion it's an action Mm. you want to alleviate the suffering Mm. in doing something about it it gives you a feeling of power and control over it of agency which is really helpful Mm. as opposed to just drowning in the feeling so i'm also kind of wondering how we get in touch with that compassion you know with the challenges the world is encountering right now it can be easy to feel angry um, you know get very frustrated at our political systems justice systems just the way the world is happening right now so how do we source that compassion within us well with me because i've been practicing mindful self-compassion for 10 years i i know what i'm feeling and what i'm thinking and how it feels and i want to make it better And for me, I know that to make it better, I need to be doing something active to make it better. So for me, I was looking at what resources that are external that I could join. So I, you know, I, I like the Anti-Defamation League. I've been involved with them either going to marches or, you know, being a donor or whatever for years. You know, I follow the Southern Poverty Law Center and I have for years the NAACP. So there's organizations that have had boots on the ground that I can lend my efforts to. And then the new one that I found that isn't new, but it's new to me, is Surge, the Showing Up for Racial Justice. Hmm. So I joined that. I'm going to get training from them. I'm going to make phone calls. I'm also going to get involved in working for Biden, who is going to hopefully prevail in 2020 so that we have a more compassionate, intelligent leadership with some integrity. That's compassionate action. That's Mm -hmm. wise action, next step, compassionate action for Mm. me to make me feel better. No, that is so important. And I really appreciate you bringing that up as action and engagement because meditation can be really beautiful, but there are some people who think of it as almost like a glorified navel gazing where, you know, you just sit in a room and you can contemplate, you know, about love for all beings. But if there's no action, is there any actual benefit uh, to the overall good of humanity? So can I answer that? Sure. Because there still would be. There still would be. I had a I had a woman this morning in my class on Zoom who kind of said that. Like she's not interested in getting involved. And I said, mm. that's fine. Mm-hmm. Because if you through your own being a good person and being kind to your neighbors and doing, you know, calling up people that are lonely and dropping off meals and, you know, whatever it is that you can do in your own little sphere of being a good human, Mm -hmm. then that is compassionate action for humanity. Mm. So we can take whatever steps, as big or as small, as long as the intention is raising the bar for humanity. Mm. Some people are going to take huge steps and some people are going to take smaller steps. But if they're done with a, with a wise, compassionate heart, they're all good. We've talked about so many things that are important in life, kindness, sourcing our happiness, cultivating our compassion. And I also appreciate you bringing up this wise heart and all these kind of just tie into core values. And in Mm -hmm. your book, you say that We need to know our core values in order to give ourselves a course correction when we veer off the track in life. And I'm wondering how one person goes about doing that in gaining the awareness of what they care about the most and then moving their life in the direction of what truly matters. Well, I'm sure you've done this through the years. I've been in so many different workshops where there's a unit on core values and there'll be like a list of 
I don't know, 120 <laughs> core values. <laughs> and you'll circle 20 of them, and then they'll ask you to narrow it down to 15, and then they'll ask you to narrow it down to 10, and then they'll ask you to narrow it down to 5, and you'll see what's left, and those will be your most core core values, mm -hmm. right? So people can find those exercises online. I explored it through this ancient practice called Musar. Um, hmm. There's a Musar Institute, and they have a whole bunch of stuff online, and it's really good internal work to do, because then you know if you're doing actions that are in alignment with your core values, you, it feels better. Mm, it really does. And you know, if one of your core values is honesty and you're lying, you'll feel terrible. Mm -hmm. Very true. When we're not living true to ourselves. And I also feel like living true to yourself is one of the most important keys to being your own best friend. I just recently did it because my sisters did it. They're taking that free happiness class from Yale University and um, through Coursera. And so I did it with them just to see what they were learning because I teach this stuff. Mm -hmm. And my number one was honesty. And then number two mm. was kindness. Number three was love. And number four was humor. And number five was love of learning. And it was interesting to see because I printed them out. Um, and then I did a Zoom with my two sisters and to see where we have any overlaps. No, it's an important level of awareness. And I, I just love the list of values that, that you mentioned. Honesty, kindness, love, and the love of learning as well. So they have 24 of them on this one. Uh -huh. So I just told you my my top five as they showed up by how I answered the questions. Oh, I really appreciate you just bringing up just so many important things in, in life. <laughs> just, you know, it's easy to get caught up, you know, in the day-to-day -day challenges and just taking that time to reflect on what, what we care about and what matters and realizing that part of the reason why we may be angry or we, why we may be frustrated is because, yeah, the things that we care about, honesty, love, compassion, kindness, learning, aren't being met, you know, in the world. Right. And things that we really care about. I was on a Zoom board meeting for a nonprofit that I'm involved in here. And the meeting went great. But when the meeting ended, I was really dysregulated. I felt really upset. And I actually mm. cried. And I dropped down, as is my practice, to notice what is up with me? Why am I feeling this way? And it was because I just care so much. I want what's best so much and they're going to have a huge deficit because of having to be closed during COVID-19 right. and it just breaks my heart and I can't fix it. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I almost want to hear about the 20 other values that, that you had also singled out, <laughs> but you know, we're going to talk about self-compassion even more, but unfortunately we are running out of time. So I wouldn't mind just closing out with a question I love to ask all of my guests because you did mention love being very high on your priority list. Mm -hmm. So what do you wish everyone or what do you think everyone should know about love? I think that that's why we're here. Mm. I think that's why we're here on the planet. And I just hope and pray and wish that people learn to love themselves, really love themselves up so that they can love everybody else. Beautiful. Love is why we are here. And fill up your own cup with so much love, it overflows to all the people around you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Julie. It's been a really wonderful joy talking to you. And for the listeners who want to hear more about you, learn more about you, how do they find you? My website is a treasure trove. There's a library on there. So not only me, but every teacher's book that I thought was informative or transformative is on there. Everybody else's websites, their newsletters. If you go to the reading and resource tab on my website, it's mindfulmethodsforlife.com. There's also um, a lot of new meditations on my podcast because I've been teaching for free for our synagogue and I've been recording the meditations. They're never scripted. I never know what I'm going to say. So they're all different. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I have this wonderful friend, Patty Lane, that's been putting them um, on my podcast and putting them up on Insight Timer for me. And she's also been using little pieces of video footage. Some of, some of them are from my travels and some of them are just um, free. 
and she's been making little videos behind them for people that don't like closing their eyes and want to focus on something. And those are on YouTube, but you can get to, get to them through my website also. And you can get to the podcast through my website also. Mm. And everything's free. And your website is mindfulmethodsforlife.com. Right. Well, thank you so much, Julie, again, for coming on to the show. And thank you, listeners, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. We hope you remember the three pillars of mindful self-compassion, which is mindfulness, self-kindness, and common humanity. And we also hope you remember that love is why we are here. So now is the time to love yourself, to give yourself those positive affirmations, to make your joy list, and also to make your gratitude journal in order to hardwire that happiness into your brain. So love yourself up so that you can learn to love others, be your own best friend. And thank you so much for listening. If you want to learn more about me, you can head to ZachBeach.com and learn more about the show at TheHeartCenter.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, head over to ZachBeach.com or TheHeartCenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.